Good morning. Blessed Easter morning to all of you. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Wherever you are this morning, whatever darkness you face, know that the love of God is stronger. Christ is risen, and the world has never been the same. Whether you're a regular part of the life of First Christian Church Bartlesville, or if this is the first time that you've been with us, welcome. Please remember to let the church know that you were in worship today. The link to our online contact card is found in the Facebook post and in the YouTube post. If you have a prayer concern, you can also let us know in this way. We have a few announcements for the life of the church. We are planning a return to in-person worship on April 18th. I'm sure that is welcome news to many of you. Uh, we will be wearing masks still and social distancing, but it will be wonderful to gather together in this place again. On the 18th, we will also have a congregational meeting. That is the next step in our New Beginnings process. So you'll, if you're a regular member here, you'll want to stay for that meeting after worship. Regular announcements, our prayer group is meeting tomorrow, Monday, April 5th at 1 p.m. by Zoom. And then also on Monday at 2 p.m., our Bible study will meet by Zoom. We're going to look at the resurrection in each of the Gospels. What does each Gospel writer have to say about the resurrection? What, it, what does resurrection mean? And how can we begin to live resurrection lives? One way is to begin our worship. So lift your faces, let your faces shine as we come before the risen Christ. Please stand and join in the call to worship. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Darkness is vanquished. The light of hope has come. Come, let us worship and celebrate the good news. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Amen. This is our time of prayer together. We know that our God stands with us when we experience great joy and when we slog through the worst days of our lives. Knowing that God is with us with a love that never gives up, doesn't give in, gives us a peace that nothing else in the world can give. If you have a joy or concern, please add it to your contact card so that we can pray with you and for you. As I offer each prayer this morning, I will say, God, in your mercy, and you are invited to respond, hear our prayer. This morning, I pray, especially for the family of Marjorie Maple, as this week they commit her to rest in God ensure and certain hope of the resurrection. God, in your mercy. I pray for Chester, for healing of his back. God, in your mercy. And for Parjam, son of Mary Helen and nephew of Phyllis in dialysis treatment. God, in your mercy. Please bow with me as we continue our prayers. Glorious God, how magnificent is your world on this Easter morning. The flowers and the green that have emerged outside our windows shout the good news of new life. Their colors and their shapes dance with joy at the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we also rise in hope and celebration at this good news. The journey has been long, O oh God, and we know that it does not end here on Easter morning. Instead, you give us our march marching orders to go out in confidence, to witness to the good news of the resurrection and to the power of your love in Jesus Christ. We are called to be bearers of the light and hope to places where the shadows remain. Keep us open to the needs and the hearts of other people. Help us to not be so quick to condemn as we are to love. Help us to reach out in kindness and compassion whenever and wherever we can for healing and for hope. 
and remind us again of the many ways in which you have and continue to bless our lives. For we ask these things in the name of the resurrected Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to turn in your Bibles, if you have one. We will be reading the scripture from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified, and they bowed their heads to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners to be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then he remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. May God bless the reading and the hearing of these holy words of Scripture. Will you pray with me? Holy God, abide in me in the proclaiming of the good news so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our minds and hearts are acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All around the world this morning, Christians are greeting each other with these words, Christ is risen and responding back enthusiastically to each other, risen indeed. So First Christian Church, people of the risen Christ, in your homes, your apartments, your kitchens, your living rooms, I proclaim to you, Christ is risen. And all of God's people say, risen indeed. We all know the story. Jesus died on the cross. He lay in the cold, dark tomb, and God raised him up on the third day. What else is there to say? There's a huge temptation for me to stop the message right here. What more is there to say than Christ is risen? It's a beautiful day. You may have hams or pot roasts in the oven, and now that many have had their COVID vaccines, the grandkids may even be coming over for the first time in more than a year. Christ is risen. Enough said. Let's go already. But I think not. There is always more. There is so much more to say, so many places to find joy and the hope of the resurrection. Most of us have heard this story ever since we were little children in Sunday school. We've listened to the resurrection story so many times that it may have lost a bit of its zing, its power, its ability to cause our jaws to hang open at its bizarre and beautiful strangeness. I'd like for you to step back with me just for a moment in time. Pretend that you are hearing this story of the resurrection for the first time. It is pretty unbelievable. And that is precisely the reaction that many who are not Christian have the very first time that they hear this story. 
especially today when we're taught that seeing is believing. When we've forgotten how to open our minds and our hearts just to crack to the improbable things in life. Our rational minds step in. Well, it could never have happened that way. It's just not possible for the dead to rise. After all, if we can't count on the dead to remain dead, what can we count on? Those disciples had the very same reaction when Mary, the mother of James, Mary Magdalene, and Joanna came running into the room where the men were staying. Luke tells us that the disciples thought it was an idle tale. He uses the word leros, the root of our word delirious. The disciples thought the women were talking out of their minds deliriously. And who wouldn't think that? His resurrection breaks all the rules. It was too good to be true, and the disciples' emotions were raw from the experience of the crucifixion. They couldn't take another disappointment. We probably would have reacted in the same way. I think about all the words that we might use to describe the resurrection if it happened today. They're the words that we hear on television ads and from our children, the those big words that try desperately to get our attention. Stupendous, blowout, gargantuan, colossal, epic, huge, awesome, and my personal favorite, ginormous. It's not enough to be gigantic or enormous now. Events are ginormous. But I'm not sure that even ginormous can really describe what the women were trying to tell the disciples. They must have been terribly overwhelmed, at a loss for the right words. Luke doesn't tell us what they did say, but I'll bet it was something with urgent simplicity, breathlessly to the point. The tomb is empty. Jesus is gone. He arose just like he told us. Remember. Remember? Remember? Remember, the women at the tomb were so shocked to find Jesus gone and those two men in dazzling clothes there that they had to be reminded of what Jesus had told them, what he promised before they could believe their eyes. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise. Remember what he had told you. Yes, the women had heard Jesus say that. They were there, just like the disciples, but they had not understood Jesus at the time. Maybe the women thought that Jesus was the one who was delirious. People don't just die and rise. What he said must have been idle talk. But now, with the stone rolled back, with an empty tomb, maybe it wasn't idle talk. Maybe it was true. Hope against hope. Maybe it still is true. Can you think of a time when you heard the news of the day and you couldn't believe your ears? If you're old enough, remember the first time that you heard that NASA was going to put a person on the moon. Idle talk. I'll believe it when I see it. And then we saw it. Six-year-old me in my basement, pictures of the moon, pictures of the blue marble we call Earth floating in space. And suddenly, the words that we had to describe what we saw were just not enough. How do you put into words the glory of God in creation and what seemed like such a miraculous journey? Ginormous and epic just can't begin to do the job. Then, a couple years ago, something else happened that many people believed that they never would or even could see. A collection of powerful telescopes took the first ever photograph of the outline of a black hole in space. How do you photograph something that can't be seen? Black holes are collapsed stars with gravity that is so strong that not even light can escape. 
According to NASA, because no light can get out, people can't see black holes. But the scientists, they didn't let that stop them. Perhaps the human eye cannot see the abyss itself, but what it can see is the edge of the abyss. And the mystery of God's creation continues to unfold. More clues to the origin of our universe, adding exponentially to my amazement about the world that our God brought into being. A few years ago, would any of us have believed that? Idle talk. Would we have believed that human beings had gone to the moon if we had not seen it? How could we believe that black holes exist if we could not at least see some evidence? We are skeptics. We hear theories as idle talk, delirious, crazy talk. The disciples, they saw the resurrection for what it was, utter nonsense, until Peter remembered. He remembered the prophecy of Jesus, and suddenly it all seemed possible. Peter ran to the tomb to see for himself. The story that the women had told was so strange, so utterly outrageous, that it might just be true. So he stooped down, he looked in, and he found the linen cloths that Jesus was buried in, and he went home, we are told, amazed at what had happened. Amazed, not sure what to think. And that is precisely the way that we should feel today, amazed, puzzled, maybe even questioning, because resurrection makes no sense in our world. How can God bring life and goodness and resurrection into a world of pandemic and death and poverty, hatred, distrust, and violence? The only logical response of the disciples was unbelief. And the only logical response for us, if we rely on our experience alone or on what we can see alone, is unbelief. Logic tells us that death is final, that death is the end. Evil in whatever form is just too much to overcome. But that kind of thinking doesn't leave room for God. It doesn't let God be God. It doesn't allow God to have the last word, that last hope-filled, glorious word. One Easter Sunday morning years ago, we worshiped at the First Christian Church in Pratt, Kansas, where my parents lived for most of their lives. Our oldest daughter was in first grade at the time. And we had just sung that beautiful Easter hymn, He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today, with all of the gusto that we could muster. And when that service ended, our little daughter bounded down the church steps, skipping, and she was oblivious to anybody else in the world around her. Kelsey was singing, and it was that familiar tune of He lives, But the words were different. Instead of he lives, she heard something else. And she sang out at the top of her lungs, gee whiz, gee whiz, Christ Jesus lives today. Gee whiz, gee whiz indeed. The Reverend Dr. Fred Craddock offered many bits of wisdom in his lifetime, But this one is one of my favorites because it speaks to the nature of faith and also what we are to do with that faith. He wrote, matters of faith are never finally proven. Faith is communicated by witnesses. When it comes to matters of faith by their very nature, they cannot be proven. We can catch a glimpse every now and then but they can't be fully seen. And this is where our vocation as Christians comes into play. It is only through the witnesses that faith is handed down. Witnesses like the women at the tomb, witnesses like our fathers and mothers in the faith, 
Witnesses like a child singing, gee whiz. Witnesses like you and witnesses like me. Sometimes we need to be shaken up by the utter nonsense, the deliriousness, the idle talk of our faith. And then we must remember that promise that Jesus made and that God kept. God loved Jesus so much that God would not let death be the final word for him. And God loves us so much that death will not be the final word for us. Yes, we doubt and we fear like the disciples, but if we look around, we see little clues, little breadcrumbs in our world that hint of resurrection and love and kindness and rebirth, a second chance. And then we are reminded that there are some things that we can still trust. God loves us and wants us to live lives of wholeness here and now and hereafter. How do you describe the resurrection? Has it become old news for you? The good news is never old. We just have to remember, 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 and then sing it out with wonder. Gee whiz, gee whiz, Christ Jesus lives today. Will you pray with me? Surprising God, you work your way into our lives sometimes as gently as a breeze, and sometimes as powerfully as a gale force wind. Thank you for unsettling us, for keeping us growing and moving along that path of faith, for helping us to see the, the pure wonder and the awe of it all. Lead us, guide us, reveal yourself to us so that we may be companions to Christ for those that we find on the way. Amen. Well, gee whiz, here we are at the Lord's table. Navigating Holy Week can be just a little bit tricky. We start out with the shouting and a parade on Palm Sunday. We remember that we were called to serve on Monday Thursday with the washing of feet and the breaking of bread, all the while knowing that the cross appears on Friday the world trying to extinguish his life. And then, Easter morning, resurrection, we bring our offerings in joyous response, our time, our love, our service, all of our resources, all for the glory of God. And now please gather anything that you have for communion. Your intention makes even a cracker and a bit of Coke or coffee sacred. I invite you to share now in communion at the Lord's Supper. In communion and with God, we come together to this table. We remember Jesus and the disciples who were gathered in the upper room. We remember the meal the fellowship, and we remember the uncertainty, perhaps even the dread. But we have an advantage. We know the ending. Beyond this cross lies resurrection and light and life and possibility and hope. This is no somber feast. This is a celebration of God's goodness. So come to the table. Come hungry and come to be fed. You are worthy. Let us pray. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. The risen Lord is with us, and the peace of the risen Lord be with you. Be with you always. Be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen high priest, 
and more yourself known by the breaking of the bread. Amen. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread. And giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it. And he shared it with the disciples, with his friends. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, Jesus took a cup and he poured it. Once again, giving thanks to God. But this cup is the covenant renewed in my blood. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me until I come again. Partake in love, partake in joy. Follow Christ this week. Seek God in all things. Find something that causes you to say, gee whiz, God is good. You are blessed. Now go and be a blessing to others. Amen.